Mr. and Mrs. Ruskin arrived in Venice on the 10th of November, 1849. They took rooms on the first floor of the Danielli Hotel and unpacked their bags in the big sitting room. A window offered a view across the lagoon towards the church of San Giorgio Maggiore. They paid 16 shillings a night, room only. John Ruskin, the most influential art critic of Victorian times, was here to gather material for the second and third volumes of his monumental survey of the city's architecture, The Stones of Venice. He was 31, self-centred, neurotic and unsociable. He'd married Euphemia Gray, Effie, in April the previous year. She was 21, bright, pretty, a vivacious dancer and something of a flirt. Ruskin was certainly well qualified to review Venice's buildings. This was his fifth visit here. He thought that the Gothic architecture of pre-Renaissance Europe represented the apex of human achievement. And buildings in the Gothic style were everywhere in Venice. His book would be illustrated with his own drawings and watercolours and dignified with long passages of his lofty prose. Thank God I am here, he recorded in his diary. It is the paradise of cities and there is moon enough to make half the painters of earth lunatic. I am happier than in all probability I shall ever be again in my life. I feel fresh and young when my foot is on these pavements. And Effie, new to Venice, was delighted with the city. It is the most exquisite place I have ever seen, she told her mother. We shall not quit in a hurry if I can help it. The climate is most delicious, always mild, never damp, the skies of the most heavenly colours, and the sea and canal so fresh and calm. Ruskin was passionate about Venice, and we can see from his writings and watercolours that he felt connected with the mystery and sensuality of the city. He was fascinated by the lagoon's tides. For him, they epitomised the organic, pulsing, female nature of the city. Venice has always been considered to have feminine gender, la serenissima, and Ruskin confused his vision of Venice with the love of a woman. For him, art would always have the edge over flesh and blood reality. He could connect with Venice's female symbolism, but there was distance between him and his beautiful young wife in their conjugal bed. He just couldn't form a full loving relationship with a woman. Their marriage was never consummated. He told her he hated children. He desired to preserve her beauty and claimed, my own passion is much subdued by anxiety and I have no difficulty in abstaining. So Ruskin spent his days scurrying around the place, poking about churches and palaces, measuring, sketching, and producing daguerreotypes, the earliest form of photographs. While he teetered on long ladders up the facade of San Marco, Effie enjoyed herself shopping, dancing, taking tea with English residents, collecting shells on the Lido beach, coffee in the piazza. Many of the buildings that Ruskin inspected have since been restored or greatly altered, but very few have been demolished. Most of them are, more or less, as they were in his time. Even the bell tower of San Marco, which fell down in 1902, was put up again ten years later as a replica. Ruskin worshipped half the buildings in Venice, and hated the other half. He knew what he liked 
and awarded it with lavish praise. First, here are some of his favourites. Beyond the ordered arches of the piazza, there rises a vision out of the earth, and all the great square seems to have opened from it in a kind of awe, that we may see it far away, a multitude of pillars and domes clustered into a long, low pyramid of coloured light, a confusion of delight amid which the Greek horses are seen blazing in their golden strength. The whole church is a great book of common prayer. The mosaics were its illuminations, and the common people of the time were taught their scripture history by means of them. Whatever the traveller may miss in Venice, he should give undivided attention and unbroken time to the scuola. It is entirely filled with the works of Tintoretto. A most interesting little piazza surrounded by early Gothic houses. This group of windows is the only remnant of a small palace modernised in all its other parts, but is one of the richest fragments in the city. The Ducal Palace is arranged somewhat in the form of a hollow square, of which one side faces the Piazzetta and another the Quay. The third is on the Dark Canal and the fourth joins the Church of St Mark. A model of all perfection. But for the buildings he didn't like, Renaissance ones, he raised scorn to the level of an art form. It is a ghastly ruin. It has been composed of arcades borne by marble shafts and walls of brick faced with marble. But the covering stones have been torn away from it like the shroud from a corpse. It has a spiral external staircase, very picturesque, but of the 15th century and without merit. A curiously picturesque example of Renaissance workmanship, admirably expressive in its ornamental sculpture. The Greek lions appear to be awkwardly balanced between conventional and derivative representation, having neither the severity for the one nor the veracity necessary for the other. On the island between Venice and Murano, the little Capella Emiliana, at the side of it, has been much admired, but it would be difficult to find a building so ridiculous. It is more like a German summer house than a chapel, or a beehive set on a low hexagonal tower. Said to contain a very precious series of paintings by Carpaccio, otherwise of no interest. Small and contemptible on a suburban island. It is impossible to conceive a design more gross, more barbarous, more childish in perception, more servile in plagiarism, more insipid in result, more contemptible under every point of rational regard. Observe that when Palladio had got his pediment on the top, 
He didn't know what to do with it. He had no idea of decorating it. He had not wit enough to fill it with sculpture. The interior is like a large assembly room and undeserving of a moment's attention. And he held the people of Venice in similar contempt. He wrote, Round the whole square in front of the church there is almost a continual line of cafes where the idle Venetians of the middle classes lounge. And in the recesses of the porches, all day long, knots of people of the lowest classes, unemployed and listless, lie basking in the sun like lizards. And unregarded children, their throats hoarse with cursing, gamble and fight and snarl and sleep hour after hour upon the marble ledges of the church porch. Following her time in Venice, Effie endured four increasingly unhappy years. Effie was oppressed by the almost pantomime grimness of her in-laws, severe Protestants. In June 1853, just after publication of the last two volumes of The Stones, or 450,000 words of them, John and Effie went on holiday in the Scottish Highlands with the pre-Raphaelite painter John Everett Millais. Effie and John fell passionately in love. And in the following year, Effie left Ruskin. She sought an annulment at the Commissary Court held in St Saviour's Church in Southwark. The marriage was annulled on the grounds of Ruskin's incurable impotency. Ruskin was red-faced and offered to prove his virility, goodness knows how, but this was declined. We'll never know whether it would have stood up in court, so to speak. Effie married Millais on the 3rd of July 1855 and soon after the wedding children arrived in a steady stream, eight of them in all. Ruskin was a pure Victorian in that he was born and died within months of Queen Victoria. In many ways he was a true child of his age. Yes, he was an undersexed, self-absorbed workaholic, but he was one of the towering figures of his age who changed the way Victorians looked at the world. He was the first to fight to save still splendid buildings that were being allowed to fall into decay, or were being altered, insensitively cleaned, drastically restored, gutted, or simply demolished and rebuilt. Venice was in mortal danger. He compared her rate of decay to that of a lump of sugar in hot tea. To him, restoration in the city was vandalism. They are scraping St. Mark's clean. Off go all the glorious old weather stains, the rich hues of the marble which nature, mighty as she is, has taken ten centuries to bestow. The Venice we see today, with the tourists and their ice creams, earnestly trekking around the Tintorettos, this Venice we see is still largely Ruskin's. And that room in the Danielli? Well, inflation has taken its toll. It's now 10,000 euros a night. Breakfast extra. <laughs>